Sometimes the Christian jargon that we use can obscure something that we're trying to say rather than clarify something that we're trying to say. So if you came to the church and you asked us what our understanding is of the, the, the return of Christ and our understanding of things related to the end times, I could say to you, well, we're amillennial. It's important to have theological categories. It's important to have a, a theological vocabulary with which to express our beliefs. But, but maybe that type of jargon obscures what we really want to say, which is we believe that Jesus is reigning as king right now. And that might make a little bit more sense than, than using the theological terminology. Or sometimes we'll, we'll say, well, we're, we're reformed. And it's good to have an understanding of what the Protestant Reformation was and, and what Reformed theology is, but sometimes that, that jargon in the ears of, of some people can, can obscure rather than clarify, and maybe it would be better to say, well, we believe that God is sovereign over all things. You might step into a church, a young, hipster, skinny jeans wearing kind of church, and you'll hear somebody say something like this, we're committed to contextualized, missional, cross-cultural gospel formation through strategic alliances within a movement of churches for kingdom actualization. And you go, <laughs> because that doesn't make any sense. It's a bunch of jargon strung together that can get in the way of saying the things that we're trying to say. And so today, today we're beginning a stewardship series, a stewardship series series. And stewardship can be a jargon word as well, because I think that if you went out on the street and you grabbed 100 people and you asked them, what is stewardship? I'm guessing probably 95% of them wouldn't have any idea. It's not a word that we use in our culture any longer. It's not a concept that is familiar to us as a category of thought any longer. And so in the culture, often stewardship means nothing. And in the church, stewardship has come to mean money. Preacher's going to talk to me about money, and primarily what he's going to do is tell me I need to give more of it. And that's our understanding of stewardship. So we don't have a, we don't have a cultural context in which to understand it. Maybe the closest thing that we possess is the Lord of the Rings movies. You may remember that the steward of Gondor was a man whom the king had put in charge before the king left to do stuff that kings do. And the steward was responsible for the administration of the kingdom. He was to stand in for the king while the king was away. He was to be accountable for the king's money and the king's people and the use of the king's resources within the kingdom while the king was away administering the kingdom in, on behalf of, of the king. He was more than a manager. He was a, a responsible agent to the king. That's what a steward is. And so today, today is the first of a, a short series on what it means to be a faithful steward. You, Christian, are a steward of the king, Jesus. And today we're going to talk about the foundations of stewardship being grounded in Christ and in what he's He's done for us. So I'd like to invite you to open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll be looking at uh, a couple of verses to begin with, verse, verses 19 and 20 of 1 Corinthians 6. You know that 99% of what I do, the bread and butter of our congregation, is preaching verse by verse through books of the Bible. And over the course of the, the next month, we're going to take a short break from that for a topical series in stewardship. And so we'll look at a number of verses today. Uh, but we'll begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll talk about how Jesus bought you and how you owe him. Because our stewardship is a stewardship of gratitude, and our debt to Jesus is a joyful debt that is born of his sacrifice on our behalf. In short, since Jesus bought you, you owe him. So let's look together at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading in the second part of, of verse 19, and I'll read verses 19 and 20. Paul writes, You are not your own, for you were bought 
with a price, so glorify God in your body. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. That word teaches us that Jesus bought us. Now, that's a truth that that we have to reckon with, and we've got some implications that we need to reckon with as well. And so, the truth is that Jesus bought us, and there's a purchase that took place. Even as Paul said, you're not your own, for you were bought with a price. And in the context, Paul is saying that you have a responsibility to care for your body, refraining from sexual immorality, because your body has been purchased by Jesus, and he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in your, your body, and so your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.22 and also in 2 Corinthians 5.5 that the Spirit indwells those as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So when Jesus bought you, he sent the Holy Spirit to take possession of you, and now the Holy Spirit resides in you, possessing you on behalf of Christ until the time Christ returns to make you fully his own through the resurrection of your flesh such that you will be fully equipped for glory and for eternity with him. But in the meantime, he possesses you by means of his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is proof that you have been purchased. The Holy Spirit residing in you is proof that you have been purchased, proof that Jesus has done for you what the Scripture says he's done for you. And what did Jesus pay in order to purchase you? Well, he paid his lifeblood. Consider what 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You were ransomed with the blood of Christ, and the blood of Christ stands for all of his work for you. He, he lived for you. He fulfilled all righteousness for you, fully obeying your heavenly Father on your behalf, and he died for you, fulfilling all justice against you and taking it on your behalf. And so you have been purchased body and soul by and for Jesus. You've been purchased. Do you see yourself as a bought person? Do you see yourself as one who has been purchased by Christ and the guarantee of it and the proof of it is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you? You are a ransomed people. You are a rescued people. You are a purchased people. You are a bought people. Christ has bought you with his blood. And so there are implications associated with this. And and you just heard this sung beautifully and movingly. In case you were wondering what the choir was singing, they were singing the first answer to the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not my own, but I belong to Jesus. Jesus owns me. He is, he is master I am servant. And so one of the things that happens when we become believers or one of the things that should and must happen over the course of our lifetime is this, that the orientation of our life must change. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden as God was, as God was uh, uh, addressing the sin in the Garden of Eden and he, and he said, he said to the, that the serpent's head was going to be crushed by the one who would come. He would undo the damage done in the Garden of Eden. And in essence, it's it's this promise. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Why? Because what was between the serpent and the woman at that moment was not enmity, not hostility, not antagonism, but union in their rebellion against the Lord. And so the orientation of the human heart from that point forward was one, as we read from Ephesians 2, of being hostile to God, being sons of disobedience, pursuing our own passions over against what the Lord wanted for us. But now in Christ, he's taken that and he's turned us back from me to he. The orientation of my life has changed from me to he, from chasing my passions to chasing his glory. And at some point along the way, for everybody who claims the name of Christ, that switch has to take place. And it happens over time as more and more in each and every area of our lives, 
we begin to see how to live for Jesus, not for me. How to glorify him, not pursue my own life and and my own passions. And so if you're a Christian, you exist for him. What is your chief end? Your chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You have a purpose. And your purpose is to glorify Jesus. More on that later. But first, a different a different implication. The implication is this, because of what Jesus has done, you are fully loved. Jesus did it all. And I want you to let this sink in, and I, want, I know I've said this before, I've said this a dozen times if I've said it once, but it bears repeating a dozen times. It bears repeating more than a dozen times. Because of what Christ has done for you, your heavenly Father cannot love you more, and he cannot love you less than he loves you right now. Because of what Christ has done for you, your heavenly Father cannot love you more and he cannot love you less than he loves you right now. You are fully loved because your Father's love for you never was dependent upon what you do or don't do. It was always dependent upon what Christ has done for you. And what Christ has done is finished. It's done. It's fixed in time. It's completed. There's no adding to it. There's no detracting from it. You can't alter it. You can't change it. And because you can't change what he's done, you can't change your father's love for you, which is based upon what he's done. Let that sink into your bones. And here's why. Because as we talk of stewardship, we do so in this context. When we engage in faithful stewardship, it's not an act of faithfulness that makes God love me more because now I'm doing with his stuff or his money or his time or his talents the things he wants me to do. And no act of failure in stewardship makes him love me less. It simply doesn't. And it gives you a context in which you can rest in Jesus and pursue faithful stewardship because you have been loved. Not in order to be loved, but because you are loved. It should lead you to have confidence in Christ and joy and rest and peace with God. You you must have those things. Not only is eternal life found by faith in Jesus Christ, but also the proper posture for a life of stewardship is found in Christ. The proper posture is I repose in Christ by faith. I rest in Christ by faith. And if I don't do that, then, then here's what, ha- what happens. Then, then when I hear words about stewardship and I hear about being faithful with the things that God has given me, then I can get on a treadmill of earning his love. Or I get on a treadmill of trying to impress my neighbor with what a steward I am. Now I'm on a treadmill of performance before the Lord instead of being in a posture of gratitude before the Lord. If I don't understand the fullness of his love for me in Christ, then I can get resentful for the demands placed upon me for stewardship because in my heart of hearts, I really still think that I own me. That it's in some way, shape, or form, okay for me to live for me, that it's all about me. And so then, then when the preacher stands up there and puts demands on you from the word of God to live for Christ, then we get resentful because we don't really understand who he is and what he's done. Or, or even worse, then we begin to, to engage in self-loathing for our failures because surely, surely, Surely God must love me less because I have failed in this particular area of stewardship. And, and so then, then you hate yourself in a way that he doesn't. Trust Jesus unto eternal life because Jesus bought you. He bought you. And what that means, among other things, is that you are fully loved. Take a moment to breathe that in and understand that nothing you do or don't do in reference to your stewardship is going to change your standing before your heavenly Father who loves you completely. He bought you. Now that comes with another side. He bought you, and that means you owe him. Every Christian is living in debt. You realize that? Every Christian is living in debt. 
Our society talks about debt. It only and always talks about it in monetary terms. Or maybe you, somebody saves your life, and now I'm perpetually in your debt because you, you saved my life. I can't ever repay it because you've given me a gift that I can't, I can't give back. And so the Apostle Paul talks about this in Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14, when he says this, You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus paid your debt before God. He paid your debt to the law before God. Now, does that mean that you no longer have any debt? No, it simply means that you owe a debt of a different kind. So, for instance, uh, years ago, years ago, uh, my uh, mortgage was owned by X Bank, and that mortgage was purchased by Y Bank. Does that mean I no longer owe any money? Woohoo! Mortgage. They bought my mortgage. No, it just means now I owe Y Bank. I'm always in the posture of being a debtor, just paying to a different company. Now, as an unforgiven sinner, you were in debt to the law to obey it and to the justice of God for failing to obey it. But Christ bought your debt with his blood. So now, are you free of debt? No, you're debtor to another. Now you owe a debt of gratitude. Now you owe a debt of gratitude. You owe a debt to Jesus. And so Paul says very clearly in Romans 8, 12, we are debtors not to live according to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. In other words, not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify the Lord, to live lives that glorify Jesus who bought us because we are in debt to Him. And that has some implications. This idea that I'm living in debt has implications. Again, the Heidelberg Catechism says, I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior. And and when it says that, it asks the question first, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Your only comfort that I'm not my own. Do you mean that being a debtor is a comfort? Yes. Do you mean that being a steward is a joy? Yes. Jesus owns you. He is master. You are servant. And so the orientation of your life has changed from me to he, from chasing my passions to chasing his glory. And if you're a Christian, then you exist for him to glorify him, and your entire life is therefore to be about the business of stewardship. Your whole life is to be an act of stewardship. When you hear the word stewardship, don't think dollar signs. Think my Life, me, body, soul, mind, heart, attitude, possessions, time, talents, education, training, job, marriage, parenting, all is for Jesus as an act of stewardship, living in debt to him who paid it all for me. Remember, a steward is a servant put in charge of another's property, another's money, or another's estate, and and the steward is responsible to use these things for the owner's benefit and according to the owner's instructions. So so we've got a couple of folks uh, in the congregation or affiliated with the congregation who are certified financial planners, right? So if you're a certified financial planner and you receive a new account and somebody gives you X amount of dollars and, and you're now a steward of that person's money. It's not like you take that money in your greedy little fists and head down to the mall and say, shopping spree. It's not your money. That's not your money. It belongs. It belongs to your client. And, and you, as the certified financial planner, are responsible to use it as the owner desires for the owner's gain and for the owner's interests. Now, you are not your own. You belong to Jesus, and you must steward yourself for his glory, not just a part of you, but all of you. All of you, all for him. 
just as a financial planner uses money for another, you must use your time and talents and education and possessions and money and heart and attitude and abilities and skills and, and all of that for him. And, and the reason why is this. They actually belong to him. If it's true that I am not my own, then I'm not my own. Then my body belongs to him, and I need to honor the Lord in my body. My mind belongs to him. I need to dedicate my mind to honoring the Lord. My home belongs to him. How, how do I honor the Lord or glorify him in my home? Well, taking care of it is a good way to start, right? That's a basic way. It's his property. It's not mine. So if I don't take care of it, what am I saying? What am I telling my neighbors if I don't take care of the home God has given me? Because he's given it to me to steward, not to own. It's his. I'm the steward. Am I faithfully stewarding it? He's given me money to steward. Am I faithfully stewarding it? The time he's given you, every breath he's given you to draw on this life, is a moment that he's given you. Are you stewarding it for him? Do you fully see yourself as belonging to him? Do you see that you have been, you have been bought and you owe him? And I want to confess, uh, this is hard. It's hard for me. It, maybe it's hard for you. That's a fundamental shift in thinking, isn't it? Because the default posture of the human heart is me, 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 me. I, 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 my, 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 my. The default posture of the human heart is Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Right? That's what comes naturally to every man and woman is to be self-concerned, self-absorbed. Why, why is marriage a sanctifying institution? Why is marriage sometimes a difficult institution? Because I like me. And I'm normal. Everyone, y'all are all abnormal. <laughs> That's the fundamental posture of, of the human heart. And so changing that thinking that I don't exist for me, I exist for Jesus, to glorify Jesus and to enjoy him forever. I am not my own. I belong to him. To be oriented toward him practically on a day-to-day -day basis from hour to hour, it can almost seem overwhelming think, wow, I'm never going to think like that. You are fully loved. If we're oriented toward him, what does it look like? Well, stewarding. What does stewarding look like? Well, you, you're to steward your body for him. And it may look like simple things. You young people or those of you who are single, honor the Lord with your body. That means refraining from sexual relationships until you're married. It's very straightforward. Your body belongs to him. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't use it to sin. That may be hard to do. It's not hard to understand if you want to devote yourself to it. it maybe it looks like this. Uh, it, sometimes I think it's easier to think of somebody else. And so it's much easier for me to, to, to say to my wife, uh, so if you want to take care of your body, get plenty of sleep each night and uh, eat more salads than you do cheeseburgers and exercise every once in a while. Because with somebody else's body, right, that's the advice you would give them. Go to your doctor, get the checkup, brush your teeth. I mean, you're going to give basic, but when it's my body, my body likes cheeseburgers. <laughs> Until it's not my body. It's not. It's the Lord's. And I'm stewarding it on his behalf. What does it mean to steward your mind? Well, what, what do you, Paul tells us to dwell upon and to think about those things that are lovely and that are holy and that are pure and that are good. But, but many of us choose to dwell on those things that are political, those things that are divisive. Those that I, what, how would you steward the mind God has given you? What are you reading? How are you equipping yourself to live as a faithful steward in the world? What are your, what are your viewing habits on, on Netflix? How do you steward the mind that God has given you for the glory of Jesus Christ? How do you steward your speech? What do you primarily use your mouth to do? What do you primarily use your social media to do? I saw a fascinating post. I don't know if it was from a Christian or not the other day. It was just a picture of an old guy sitting in a rocking chair. And the old guy in the rocking chair said something like, life is really short. So make sure that you spend as much time as possible on social media debating politics. <laughs> and it's an indictment of many in the church 
What a, how will you steward your speech to be salt and light in a world that's gone mad? How do we steward our talents, our education, our career? Oftentimes to people in the business world, I recommend a particular book. It's called uh, The Search for God and Guinness. And it's about the Guinness family that founded the Guinness Brewery in Ireland. And about a third of the Guinnesses were brewers, and about a third of the Guinnesses were politicians, and about a third of the Guinnesses were preachers. And they all had the same idea of what to do with the business, and they reinvested it in the community, and they reinvested it in their workers, and they raised the standard of living for all of Ireland through a brewery. For what does your business exist? For whom does it exist? How do we steward, uh, steward our family, children? You, how do you steward your relationship with your parents? Well, the scripture tells you to obey your mother and father. It tells you to honor your mother and father. Parents, how do you steward your children? The, the entire point is that use who and what you are and what you have purposefully, thinking through it purposely, and it's going to require something on your behalf. Because what that looks like for you is not going to be the same for me. And there are areas of my life where I really struggle to be a faithful steward. And I go up and down from day to day or week to week or month to month. And I struggle with it. And that might be different for you. And so you're going to have to go find a place to sit and think and pray to God and ask the Holy Spirit to help you think through these categories. To think through what it means to steward all these things that God has given you for the glory of Jesus Christ and ask the Holy Spirit to convict you and pray for devotion to Jesus and for wisdom in how to begin living as a steward because if you are a Christian, you are a steward and you are not your own. And the true question that each of us faces is this, well, am I a, a faithful steward or a faithless steward? And when you ask that question and then you're convicted by it and then you repent of it and you pursue renewed obedience, remember this, I am fully loved. I get the privilege of living for Jesus. I get the joy of living in debt to him. I don't pursue stewardship to be loved. I pursue it because I have been loved as an act of gratitude to Jesus who is our master. And we sing this stuff all the time, but sometimes I think we sing it and miss it. We sing what Jesus has done and then what we owe, but, but we miss it. So Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. We sing all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my beings ransomed powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. We, we sing, take my life and let it be ever only all for thee. We sing, Jesus, master, whose I am, purchased thine alone to be. We sing it, but the scripture calls us also to live it. And I freely confess I don't. I don't every day. I don't. Not in every area of my life. I'm still learning. I'm still afraid. I'm still selfish and self-absorbed. I still need to repent and ask the Holy Spirit to equip me faithfully to steward. And maybe, maybe that's where you find yourself today. But it's important because you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You can't hope to repay Jesus. And stewardship is not about repaying Jesus. It's not about, it's not about making the ledger equal at the bottom. You could spend an eternity trying to repay Jesus, and you'll never repay him. But you can seek in gratitude to serve as a faithful steward of all that belongs to him which he has entrusted to you. So when we say things like, and and this is what I want to avoid, when we say things like, we're going to have a stewardship series, Some people, even in the church, hear this. We're committed to contextualize missional cross-cultural gospel formation through strategic alliances within a movement of churches for kingdom actualization. (laughs) Maybe it's better if we say, I'm going to tell you a story about a man named Jesus, and it will change your life. And for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how to live like your life has been changed. Because that's really what we're going to talk about. We're going to spend November talking about stewardship. Maybe it's better to say we're going to spend November talking about living joyfully in debt to
to Jesus. Because the fact of the matter is, he bought you, and you owe him because you belong to him. Oh, and praise God for it. You belong to him, and that means that you are fully loved in Christ. And so I invite you this month, I invite you to join me as we learn how to live as joyful debtors. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that he has rescued and redeemed and bought us. Father, we would commit ourselves to be those who learn how to live accordingly as faithful stewards, not not to earn your love, not to impress one another, not to feel better about ourselves, but because we truly recognize that you've bought us and we owe you. Help us to live as joyful debtors, those who delight in Jesus and who delight to serve him. We commit this desire to you and pray for your spirit's power to enable us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.